This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Thank you for listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, where we discuss the latest and greatest news in the world of sports. I am Ben. Hey, I'm Alex. What's up, man? Oh, not much, man. Just, you know, another day. Another day, another dollar? Another day in, paragra- another day in paradise. I'm sorry. No, not paradise. It's too hot to be paradise. Well, Unless it is paradise hot in paradise. Is like so. the desert to you. Okay, if you think this is bad, go to, like, Arizona. I don't want to do that. It's, like, way worse nope. there. I if it's you, like 105 here, it's probably 10 degrees hotter it's in Arizona. 1,700 degrees there. I couldn't imagine doing that. I would not like to do that. I've been to Arizona. Yeah, me too. I've had, I have family in Arizona, so like I go there from time to time. And I went from Washington to Arizona last year. I'm on my way back from Washington, and it was really like windy in Washington and super hot. It was like cold There's totally in different climates. Yeah, like I didn't even have to leave the airport, and I got in there. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is so hot. Just even in the airport, you already knew. I'm thinking. I'm just thinking about how hot it is right now, and I'm, I'm gonna be getting hot. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like it, it's like 100, 400, 5 here, in Sacramento. It's gonna be at least probably 10 degrees hotter in Arizona. I saw this video. This guy was cooking an egg. Oh, on the ground, right? Uh-huh, and then or steaks, and then he had cookies baking in his car. Oh man, that that's like a a laughing matter, but that's just way too extreme for me. Imagine the air conditioning bill is there. Oh, man. Like, why do people want to retire in, in Arizona? It's cheap, man. Look how hot it is. <laughs> no it, one wants to live there. What do you mean cheap? Your your air conditioning bill is going to be out the, out the wazoo. It's really cheap in Arizona. Well, at least compared to California. California is one of the most expensive places to live. Don't believe me, I know that. <laughs> All right, Alex. So what do we have on the show for today? Well, we're going to do a draft recap of the NBA draft. We're going to talk about winners and losers and give you some updates on ongoing tournaments currently in tennis. But we have to, unfortunately, start with some more uh, unfortunate, somber news to start the day, I suppose you could say. Um, Two greats in the coaching world have, uh, unfortunately, passed. Uh, Pat Summit, the longtime um, Lady Vols coach there in Tennessee, uh, passed away today at uh, didn't say the age. 64. 64, yeah. I don't want to 64. Do She's born in 52. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah, there it is. I should have looked farther down. And I believe she had, did she have cancer? No, no, no. She had like early onsets of dementia, uh, like Alzheimer's sort of thing going on there. So That's unfortunate. Her family over the weekend put out and said she wasn't really doing too well. Mm. It was really just, unfortunately, like you mentioned, a matter of time for her to... Mm-hmm. To pass away, so then it just happened a couple of days after they did that. So I kind of like Muhammad Ali, like they put him in the hospital. Mm-hmm. His family said he's not really doing too well, and a couple of days later he passed away. Same thing here with Pat Summit, unfortunately. Okay, and then um, yes, unfortunately, as well, football great Buddy Ryan, father of Rex and Rob Ryan, uh, has unfortunately passed away at the age of 82. Uh, his death was confirmed by the Buffalo Bills, who employ his both sons, as a matter of fact, and their current agents. Um, in his hometown of or home state of Kentucky, uh, but there's no cause. You know, he knows he, that that isn't insane. I mean, that's not insanely old. My grandmother's older than that currently, and she's quite healthy. But um, I'm not saying you know it's anything other than maybe it was just old age. You know, yeah, it was just that time. Um, unfortunately, yes, he does. AJ too. Um, those who know him as the innovator of the 42 defense with the Chicago Bears in the 85 season, the mo- one of the most dominant, if not the most dominant defenses of all time. Definitely the most dominant per season defense of all time. Do you think that's the greatest defense in the NFL history? No, because I look at defenses as a body of work in one season. Not just a one-year thing? Yeah. Okay. I, I hold the, obviously, I hold the steel curtain. steel curtain up there. I, heard, I hold, um, I look at the Legion of Boom as something that's different because it's not always the secondary is the, is the strongest point of defenses in the history. So I look at that as, as a defense that was really big. I look at the early 2000 Ravens. Um, it's hard because I don't mean just the 2000 year, which was a year that could rival the 85 Bears in a lot of aspects. I don't look at it in that sense. 
uh, I look at it. Like I said, I try to look at it as a whole, you know. Um, I, there's a lot of good, you know, single defensive years. The 76 Steelers, as a matter of fact, is probably the best defensive year they ever had. And they didn't even win the Super Bowl that year. And then you have the 85 Bears, you have the 90 Ravens, you have the 2013 Seahawks. I'd say even the Broncos of last exactly. year. Exactly, I'd say last year's Broncos. Um, so plenty of single-year great defenses, but in, I, I definitely look at body of work. But that being said, he developed a defense that, of course, was figured out eventually. Um, Dan Marino being the catalyst to that, um, you know, devising a plan to beat that. But, you know, that thing, that defense was just dominant. And then, of course, he moved on and he was the head coach of the Eagles for a while there. Uh, you know, he was also, you know, fun, fun fact, you know, what his first job in um, professional sports was? No. In the AFL, he was linebacker's coach for the Joe Namath led Jets. Okay. Yeah, he like you mentioned, he really was the. He won a Super Bowl. Yeah, as a player or no, no, no. Again, with the, the, in the that Super Bowl against the Colts, Super Bowl three. As a player. No, as the coach of the as linebackers. Coach. Okay, and, and then the obviously the defensive coordinator of the Bears in the '85 season. But, so. Yeah, so he won two there, and like I said, moved on to the Eagles, coached there. I had some. I mean, obviously some very notable players that are now notable people. You know, Ron Rivera said, "Rest in peace, buddy Ryan. Thanks for being the, my first defensive influence." The NFL lost another innovator. And I'm sorry, I said 42 earlier. It's the 46 defense. My apologies. Um, you know, uh, Singletary played for him. Uh, Jim McMahon's not really around much. Well, they had a, they had a anymore, decent offense but still, but they you did, mentioned yeah, McMahon. Not bad. Walter Payton was still on there. Mm-hmm. A lot of, yeah, lot of good Yeah, everyone plays. looks at that defense. William, William, the refrigerator Perry. Yeah, on, everyone looks at that defense, on though. Offense. I feel like they probably could have, like, at least won a handful of games, like, Basically punting on first down, like just solely on their defense. Yeah, their defense is one of the most insane defenses of all time. They, that was a team that you could really have not a lot of offense and just dominate games somehow. Like their their stats up here. So I have some stats of yeah. the eighty five Bears defense. Okay. Okay. They allowed one hundred ninety eight points that whole season. Now, do you have an average of? Uh, you know, do you have an average of like what? What does an average points per season for a defense? No, this is just the the ranks. I here. think I want to say it's something in the two hundreds usually, but it's just fine. You can continue. I'm just, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. It. This is just for that's that okay. whole for that whole season of the NFL. They led in every single category here that's listed. So they okay. only gave up 198 points. They only allowed 4,135 yards. Wow. Between passing and rushing, and I mean, look, you look at it now, every Quarterback at least throws for about 3,000. The good ones are throwing for at least 4,000. This is combined. Mm-hmm. Rushing yards, they allowed 1,319. They only gave up 236 first downs. Wow. So if you look at that as like 16 games, yeah. you know, that's like nothing. That's Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty like, impressive. That's like With only one over loss, 10. too. Right, right. They went 15-1 and one that year. They allowed six rushing touchdowns. They had 34 interceptions. They forced 54 turnovers, and they had 64 sacks. The year before that, they had 72 sacks in 1984. Just, just a dominant, dominant defense. I, You mentioned you look at defense as more of a long-term thing. Maybe as a one-year thing, I think this is probably the best one. Which, I, I coming from a guy who's not a big Bears fan, obviously, <laughs> that's hard for me to say. But just they literally carried him off the field. At they the did. Super Bowl, basically, like, you are our leader. They carried both coaches, too, which one? How often do you see that? Head exactly. Head coach and coordinator? Exactly. You don't look at the coordinator getting carried off the field. I mean, maybe Jim Schwartz when he went back to beat the Lions, but mm-hmm. that's the only one I can really Jim remember. Schwartz. But, yeah, Buddy Ryan, unfortunately, <laughs> that's pretty good. died at the age of 82. So, And then not to um, to look past any of Pat Summit's successes either. Um, obviously, taking over for Lady Vols in 74 when she was only 22 years old. Uh, yeah, she started. She was the head coach of that program at 24. Yeah. So she was an assistant there at 22, but then she started head coaching at 24 years old. No, she beca- it says she became the head coach in 74 at the age of 22. Oh, really? I thought I was 24 years old, but no. okay. That's even more impressive. Yeah. I mean, 22 like barely years old, older, yeah. You're barely into your a, mm-hmm. adult life, and you're already the head coach of a national collegiate big time program. Exactly. Yeah. In 38 years there, she won eight national titles. Title, excuse me, two games short of 1,100, 1,098. 
most by any Division One basketball coach, male or female. Yep, ever. Um, 31 consecutive appearances in NCAA tournament, which is not even close to being tied or passed by anybody else. Uh, just amazing numbers for somebody who, I mean, for one of the first, and I don't mean this in any kind of degrading way, one of the first women to really do it. And she opened the door for a lot of other women's coaches. Um, she, st- you know, she got another uh, a 16th SEC championship, and the last year she stayed there. I remember that year too. Um, she, in 2011, she announced she had um, early early onset Alzheimer's, which is yes, what she passed away from. Um, she retired in 2012, but her last year she won an SEC championship. You're um, going de- out on the uh, on top there. Mm-hmm. Developed two uh, Final Four appearances. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, apparently developed a very awesome relationship with Peyton Manning, who's a Tennessee alumni. Yes. Um, to the point where, Penn, where Peyton consulted Pat to stay at Tennessee throughout her time there. Uh, it's just um, very impressive in what in terms of what she did, and it shouldn't be overlooked um, either. Very impressive for her, and honestly, one of the most impressive college football, I'm sorry, college um, basketball, just stories ever. You know, that's 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 on par with Wooden. That's on par with with those early teams that he coached. You know, she was just a winner from yeah, day one. Yeah, she really. In my opinion, I look at Pat Summit as really, when you're looking at women's sports, she's definitely on that Mount Rushmore. She oh, really, yeah. r- really changed up the women's game there, really revitalized it, sort of took over with Tennessee and turned them into literally just a dynasty within, you know, 15, 20 years, early 2000s when sort of maybe Gino Oriyama started taking over there at UConn and they would have their battles, UConn and Tennessee. I look at him now as sort of the the leader of the women's basketball revolution, but none of that would have ever been possible without Pat Summit being there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, just a legendary coach. You mentioned eight national titles. She's only two behind John Wooden, who used to coach at UCLA. So yeah, exactly. really sort of like the women's John Wooden in a way, just absolutely controlling everything that went on there in such a a tough market to look at when you're looking at really more so recently than – early in the 70s, mm-hmm. 80s, with SEC more, you're looking at football as oh, yeah. being like the, you know, the head honcho there, but still keeping the interest here in the women's game and in basketball, selling out arenas every single night, getting the top high school recruits to go there without even blinking or thinking twice, just dominating everything that went on with women's sports and women's basketball, especially in that South, which we mentioned is tough with the football being mm-hmm. so dominant. So, you know, just... Legendary coach, you're never going to see another one like her again. So yeah, she made Tennessee for recruits, you know, coming out of high school. In her time there, like USC for football players in that same same time zone, or, ba- or Alabama, just if they get recruited there, you know, they're going there. And like we're talking about all these great credentials she has. Think about how much more she could have done had she not had the unfortunate circumstances yeah. happen to her. She could have, she could still be coaching now. Yeah, I mean, coaches a lot of time go into their 60s, late 60s. Mm-hmm. So she, well, I mean, she was in her early 60s, but she could have been, yeah, she could have been going for 1,100 plus. You know, obviously, she only two games off, but yep, unfortunately, that happened today. Buddy Ryan and her, and a lot of, a lot of, you know, unfortunate passings already this year. It's too bad. A lot of legends of sports too. Muhammad Ali passes, greatest boxer of all time. Kimbo Slice, really the king of the underground fighting scene. So a lot of a lot of great legends of the game, unfortunately, mm-hmm. passing away. So and condolences out to their family, as always. And um, unfortunately, we have to move on from that. Yeah, we got the unfortunate news out of the way, and we we'll get to some more, some some, some more some some brighter happy stuff. news. So um, we'll take a quick break, and then we will come back here with our NBA draft recap. So you guys don't go anywhere, Ben, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. And 
we are back here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, but something's missing, Alex. What's that? I didn't see your six shooters coming out of the break there. Do you want me to go back and why, do Why did we not? There we go. Why Sorry. did we not see your patented six shooters come out? <laughs> I was putting, I was putting my, my pen down. <laughs> I, I did a pen shot. I, I shot with my pew. There you go. Quick. There you go. All right, so now we're going to be <laughs> jumping in to a recap of the NBA draft, which was last Thursday. Mm-hmm. So we have a profile here of about the top ten list. A few notables in there, uh, really a historic draft. Internationally wise, we had a lot of international, the most ever, which we'll dive into a little later as well. So number one and number two, we mentioned last week's show, pretty much set in stone. We know what is going to happen, and it did go as projected. So Ben Simmons from LSU goes number one to Philly, really going to be the centerpiece of that franchise now. A lot of young, talented players as well. Jalil Okafor, they were not able to do a trade with Boston for that number three pick, so they mm-hmm. still have Okafor, Noel. You're going to throw Simmons in there. So really a lot of big bodies there in Philly. Yeah. You'll have to see what. Maybe they'll still try to do some sort of trade maybe mm-hmm. during the season or see what happens. Obviously, Joel Embiid as well. He has not played yet. The young man from Kansas had a lot of injuries, but he has been cleared for 5 on 5 scrimmages. So if he can stay healthy, it's going to be his time to play this year as well. So... You have four big, big bodies there, and a lot sort of questions to be answered there in Philly, so we'll have to see what happens there. So number two from the Lakers, Brandon Ingram, selected out of Duke, the long, lengthy forward there, kind of like a Kevin Durant type, a slasher, good shooter, going to be obviously the centerpiece of that franchise as well. Really a revolutionary time for the Lakers, new coach, Kobe Bryant's gone, so you have New players coming in, D'Angelo Russell, Julius Randle, Jordan Clarkson, and now Brandon Ingram. So another young, young team that will try to make some noise in the NBA. And then number three, Boston, as we mentioned, Mm -hmm. were not able to make a trade. Danny Ainge, the GM at Boston, was really, really trying to make a trade. He had eight picks going into the night. And Boston, a team kind of looked at as one of the best teams in the East. They were the number three seed, I believe, so... A team that didn't really need young players, try to trade them for some veterans maybe. They tried mm-hmm. to do the, the, the Noel trade with Philly, but they weren't able to get it done. So they end up drafting Jalen Brown, who's a small forward at a Cal, kind of like a two-guard small forward type. And then we move on to Phoenix. They end up drafting the young man from Croatia, Dragon Bender. That's four, four straight picks forwards. Four forwards for the first four picks. Yeah, we didn't see a guard, so number five with yeah. Minnesota. But, and I'll, uh, I'll get to it more when, when we get to eight. But once we get to eight, that's another forward, and that's five forwards in the top eight. Yeah, and you kind of look at now with how the NBA is kind of changing, Alex, with having these big guys playing smaller roles here, kind of like Mm – I look at kind of like Draymond Green as the prototype. A a taller guy who's really playing more of a perimeter style. That's Mm -hmm. what a lot of teams – like the stretch four is really, really recent. A lot of teams are really – trying to copy the Warriors style of play Mm -hmm. and that's what a lot of these picks are you can see Ingram tall guy at 6'9 step down on the perimeter and hitting jump shots so Dragon Bender as well seven footer who steps out and hits jump shots kind of like a Dirk Nowitzki type so Mm -hmm. what do you think about how the NBA sort of changing here I think it's good and bad you can't look at a team and see what works for them and just say you're going to do it and hope it works for you Um, so that's a tricky thing that they have to keep in mind but it's a clever concept to go with, you know, and then you look at, like, obviously I'm a Kings fan, you look at the Kings, and we'll get into their draft in a little bit, but it's like they did the exact opposite, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into that later. Okay, Alex, so at number five, uh, Minnesota here, mm-hmm. drafting Chris Dunn, the point guard out of Providence. I'm really First surprised. First forward I'm really surprised he fell to five. Yeah, I thought he could go as early as three, depending on that trade ability. You know, I didn't see Dragon Bender also at four, to be honest. Uh, I could I could have seen them going with a with a guard. They haven't really had a dominant guard since that season Isaiah spent there, uh, Isaiah Thomas. So, yeah, I didn't expect him to go Bender there. Um, I do like Chris Dunn's good player. Um, like I said, first guard, uh, he's a point guard out of Providence. Minnesota could use a, a nice point guard, so it, it'd be it'd be nice to see if he can develop for them there because they're definitely lacking that production out of uh, out of the uh, the one. Yeah, Ricky Rubio is he's a good player, he's a great passer, a good great defender. Passer, yeah. But he really can't stay healthy. And and it's not like he's a game changer on the offensive side of the of the yeah, game. Like he's he's true. he's kind of a guy like Jeremy Lin. Um I, I, I look at where he can score points and he can score them in bunches at times, but he's not the guy that's gonna go out and put up thirty, you know. Um that's really what they're trying to get here with Dunn, who can put up, you know, 
He's a good offensive player, uh, especially for a point guard. He's a good passer, but he's a better shooter, I want to say. And you know, he's a guy that can, when he's on, he can get you 25 points a game. Not obviously averaging, but I mean, he can go out there and he can score. Yeah, really, so. really streaky player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really like that pick. We'll jump into that a little later with the winners and losers because I have a strong opinion about the number five pick with Minnesota. So, well, they need the number six pick. We get New Orleans. So we have number six. We have Buddy Heald, who I thought was a lock to go five to about eight, if not sooner than that. But I had him in that about about that range. So, what do you think of him going to New Orleans Pelicans at number six? Um, there's teams I would have rather him gone to. My, put it Perhaps that. like the team that was originally picking at number eight. Yes, um, and I was okay with the pick that they had too. That they traded, but uh, we'll know, talk about that later. That. Uh, but um, Buddy Hill's a good player. He's a good shooting guard. Like I said, he played in Oklahoma. He's also a guy that can come out there and he can, and he can give you points. You know, he, yeah, he's he a very can, good shooter. Yeah, New Orleans. I'm not really sure who they have at their one and two. Uh, to be fair, I really, you know, well they, I know they have Tyreek. I know they have the brow. He fits a big need because they no longer have Eric Gordon, who yes. was at the two. Yes. So, so Tyreek, Drew Holiday, and Buddy Heald now really. And, yeah, and then Anthony Davis court. there at the five. Um, that's not a bad young team, to be honest. Obviously, Anthony Anthony Davis was the rookie of the year. Um, you have Tyreek Evans, who when he's with the Kings, was the rookie of the year. You have a, a pretty heralded rookie coming in with Buddy Heald. People think he's going to be pretty good. So that's, a, that's a not a bad young starting five if he, if he cracks the starting lineup. You know, quickly, which you'd assume it drafting somebody at the six, they probably will. Um, yeah, made the playoffs. They made the playoffs two years ago. They mm-hmm. were the eight seed. They got swept by the Warriors. But then last year, they were looked at as the team to sort of make the jump. Anthony Davis really make the jump, but they had a lot of injuries. Yeah, so. they had an insane amount of injuries. I went to both of the times they played here in Sacramento, both of those games, and it was a hundred percent different lineups both times. Not to mention. I, kn- I guarantee they led the league in different lineups, like the amount of lineups. Like, you know, people look at in the NFL the um, different, like, starting five offensive linemen, you know, and who had the most combinations per year kind of thing. Um, and I guarantee they had the most different combinations, 100%. It was insane mm-hmm. to watch. It's, it's just one of those, like, for, like, anomalies almost, you know? Yeah. So that's definitely a pick that helps them. Yeah, I think I think Buddy Hill's a nice pick for New Orleans. He's a really good shooter, a really good leader. He's the Wooden Award winner mm-hmm. in college. He won the Big Twelve Player of the Year his junior year and senior year. So, a little concern there with the age. He has a senior, so he does kind of have that three year difference between some of these younger guys like Simmons funny, and man. Ingram. I was watching, so I was watching the NBA draft, and it makes me laugh. It was like he's coming in. He's twenty three years old or twenty four, whatever he was. And um, oh, what is his name? He's from PTI. Wilbon? Uh, Michael Wilbon? Tony Kornheiser? No, Mike, yeah, Michael Wilbon. He's sitting and he goes, oh, my God, is he going to live past his rookie season? He's so old. And he's like, I don't get these people. <laughs> 24 is a perfectly fine age right. to come into the NBA. Like, that, maybe that's better. You know what I mean? I, I hate when these guys come in and they're, you know, fresh off their 19th birthday. Like, in, a way, in a way, I say yes and no because I look at some of the good players in the NBA. Damian Lillard did not come out as a freshman. Mm-hmm. He went – to college a few years at Weber State. Steph didn't. Steph Curry came out as a junior. So you have some Clay. of these guys, Clay Thompson from Washington State as well. But then you look at guys like, okay, Buddy Heald is the same age as Anthony Davis. And look where he, look where he is already. Exactly. So you, I can look at it kind of both ways. You have, I don't know, age is really just a number. You do have that three-year, you know, difference there between the two as opposed to like a Brandon Ingram or a Buddy Heald. So I don't think it's a huge, huge determining factor, but I think the people like scouts and GMs look at it as more of a uh, a potential upside because if you can reach kind of like the Anthony Davis level when you're 22, 23 years old, as opposed to a guy coming out of the draft who's that at that age, mm-hmm. there's there's a big difference there. You know there what I mean? Is. Yeah, so, I, I just think it's like it's not like they're 30 years old, coming, right? You know, right. like um, what was it, Brandon Whedon? Came into the NFL at 28. Yeah, because he that's he a little playing, different, especially when it, baseball. Exactly, especially when it comes down to like a contact sport, you know. And they, you know, they say you know a man's um, athletic prime is like 30 to 33 or whatever. Like that's when you enter it. Like that's the peak. And, and I mean, I think it's just it's not like a bad thing to have a guy who maybe is just a little bit more mature in terms of him as a person. Not even necessarily like his personality maturity. I mean. He's just he just is a smarter person. He's older. He knows more. You know, I don't see that as a problem. 
Yeah, I don't I mean I don't either. You can kind of go both ways there. But so mm-hmm. moving on at number seven, Denver Nuggets select Jamal Murray. He's a guard out of Kentucky. He can really play both guard positions. I'd say more of a shooting guard. He's a really good shooter. Mm-hmm. Kind of undersized though, so that's why I see him maybe going back and forth between the point guard and the shooting guard spot. But they do have Emmanuel Moutier, who they drafted last year, the young man from America who went over to play in China before going to skip down on college, kind of like Brandon Jennings did. Yeah. So he decided to go to China, which they drafted last year at the point guard. Number eight, originally by the Sacramento Kings, but they traded this pick to the Phoenix Suns. So they select Marquise Chris. He's a stretch four style player out of Washington. I really feel bad for Chris. Yeah. Because I was say, you know, I like from, this pick initially. He's from Sacramento. So well, he's from he's from your mine in your hometown, Elk Grove, which is just a suburb. It's about twenty ish minutes from Sacramento. So he was basically drafted by his hometown team. Yeah, like and then you got traded. You could have gone to your mom's house for dinner. You know, what I mean, he could have slept, you know, at his mom's house right. and then gone to the game later that day. You right. Know I mean? like, so he's drafted by his hometown team, and then well, we're shipping you to Phoenix. So yeah. I find it interesting that the Kings traded within their own division. Normally, you don't see that very often. Yeah, with basketball, though, it does, it's not as as different as, like, say, like, football, where it's four teams. You have a lot of teams in your own division, you know what I mean? Okay. And it's not like Phoenix is their number one rival. Like, I would I would look at it as weird if they traded them, if they traded the pick to, like, the Lakers or the Warriors, for instance, you know? It's, I feel like it, it's such a big division, you know? It's not as weird as opposed to, say, like, if you have a star running back that's on the end of his career, so you trade him to a team in your division, and then he plays you twice a year. You know, right. So, uh, so Chris joins Dragon Bender with two top eight picks from Phoenix. Really similar positions. Dragon Bender and Marquise Chris will like to play on the perimeter, mm-hmm. excluding the stretch that Marquise Chris kind of brings. Yeah, to the Chris table. about six ten, Bender a true seven footer. So, mm-hmm. uh, if they're playing them both, that's really a matchup nightmare if they can sort of develop because you have to have two guys that are big enough to guard on the perimeter if they're both on the on the floor so that that could, interesting to see how that works out and then it's funny because you look and people like people go oh well the kings didn't need another stretch four or five they have demarcus and they have more of a true five uh you know with Collie with stein. Collie stein well just you wait until we get into their draft a little bit yeah we'll jump into that with the winners and losers because i think alex and i have some opinions on. i have strong things. opinions but it kind of goes both ways because there's things that made like excited me but there's things that just disappointed me so with the kings trading the number eight pick they picked up the 13th pick the 28th pick and they picked up the rights to a guy who's still in europe which is bagnan bagovich bagdanovich yeah Bagdanovich. Yeah, they, they traded they got the 22nd pick that um, was with the bellinelli trade because the kings made yeah, another so, trade with charlotte mm-hmm. which is the 22nd pick for marco bellinelli I said, don't forget that either so they get so they ended up with we'll get into it but they ended up with they turned one pick into three picks pretty much and that's what i did like about that Okay, so we'll so get we in, look, and we we'll did. Jump into that. You did. You did get kind of a more proven guy with Bogdan. Literally, his name is Bogdan Bogdanovich. It's his first name and it is his last name plus the ending of his last name. It's that's that's unique. But yes, moving on to the number nine pick in Toronto. And number nine is Jacob Podol. He's yeah, thank from Utah, you. I, but I didn't know how to say that name. He's, he's from originally from Austria, so yeah, he's he spent a, some time here in the United States. This has really been a, a trend here. He's a big dude. Ben Simmons is from Australia, but he came over. Yeah, to he's LSU. lived here pretty much his whole life. Yeah, uh, Buddy Hield's from the Bahamas. Jamal Murray's from Canada. So you have this international flavor here coming to college. So really interesting. And then rounding out the top 10, probably the biggest surprise in the top 10 is Thon Maker. He's yeah. the seven-footer from Australia, Canada. He's he's actually out of high school, but by the age rule, he was able to become eligible. A lot of people predicted him maybe mid to late first rounder, but mm-hmm. Toronto – not Toronto, I'm sorry. Milwaukee really, really liked Thon Maker. Doesn't they it said, sound you know like what? a Vikings name? Kind of does. Thon Maker. But, you know, uh, Toronto, not Toronto, I keep saying Toronto for some reason. Milwaukee okay. really, really liked Thon Maker. And they said, you know what? We really like this kid. We're going to draft him. So a guy who's seven foot tall, really has kind of guard intangibles, really good off the dribble. He can step out and shoot. So I, I think the storyline of the top 10 here is the amount of stretch fours, mm-hmm. that sort of style, that, that Golden State style really transitioning to other teams trying to copy that you look at bender look at chris look at thon maker you can even say at 11 with okc with demontis sabonis another stretch guy so that's really my big takeaway from the draft here is that teams are trying to copy that golden state mindset big guy stepping out hitting jump shots yeah and like i said in the top 10 you had five forwards alone so i mean only one of them really also would be thon maker really being 
like a, a for sure power forward. The other ones can kind of play both. So, um, yeah, no, definitely interesting top 10, to say the least. Yeah, we have a couple notables here, a couple that I wrote down. At number 14, the Chicago Bulls, like Denzel Valentine, a pick mm-hmm. I absolutely love. I talked about him on the preview show. Kind of reminds me a lot of a smaller, less bulkier Draymond Green, a guy who can score, rebound, and assist. I think he's going to go into a great, great team there with Chicago, good young players like Jimmy Butler. And then Alex, he's actually going to wear jersey number 45. I saw that. So kind of like the vintage coming back the from The comeback from MJ. return, yeah, the return MJ. So it's really right? interesting there. And then another one I wrote down is that the Houston Rockets at pick number 43 select Joe Chi from China. Seven foot two, another stretch guy who can come out and step out, hit the three. So the Rockets going back with a China guy, kind of like they did with Yao Ming years ago. Yeah, it's almost like a carbon copy almost. Well, they're, they're play a lot different styles. Yao Ming, obviously a, a true center, played down in the post. Joe Chi is more of a, a guy who can step out, hit the jump shot, play off the dribble. So It's a great name, too. It is, Joe Chi. But I, I just found it interesting that the Rockets going with another China guy after they drafted Yao Ming so many years ago. So, mm-hmm. And he, he's huge. He's seven foot two. He has a wingspan of a 7'8". Yeah. That's incredible. So I don't want to play it. Definitely, I'm not playing one-on-one with him. <laughs> definitely a lot of size. So yeah. we'll have, just have to see how Joe Chi can develop as a member of the Houston Rockets. Yeah, man, I'm looking forward to it. Um, that was a long conversation, but we had to take our last break. But yeah, we're going to do some winners and losers next. Um, and we'll get we out of here. a little yeah. bit about the Kings, some other teams as well that made some Coming draft up. day trades mm-hmm. that we liked or disliked. So we're going to take one more quick break here the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, and we'll be back with the winners and losers of the NBA Draft. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. There's those six shooters I was looking for <laughs> last break. <laughs> Comes back with them just a break late. Those are hard. Those are those are like intense ones too. Um, okay, before we get into our winners and losers, because um, we can't stay forever today, guys. Um, before we get into our winners and losers, we have an update on current Wimbledon um, games that are, or matches, I should say, that are going on. Um, so. For those of you who are interested in tennis, we have some some pretty high ranked players. I'll start with the women's side here, and we have Miss Garbine Magaruza, a favorite of Ben's. There, uh, when, when she's the win, the winner of the French Open. Uh, she won in two sets out of three, not straight sets. Unfortunately, she got a little bit of a got a little bit of a fight there in the second set from uh, Camila Giorgi out of Italy. Um, she ended up winning and in advancing, uh, of course. And then you have um, German. Miss Germany, probably the best player from Germany, um, number four in the world, Angelique Kuber, uh, and one in straight sets over England's Laura Robeson. So two pretty um, pretty heavy duty matchups there, um, not to be looked by, over by um, Caroline, or Caroline, whichever way you want to say it, Wozniacki's game against world number thirteen ranked Svetlana Kuznetsova. There you go. Uh, currently, um, Wozniacki's in a bit of a b- bit of a pickle here. She uh, lost the first set seven five, and is currently down five one in the second set. She's um, come back to make it five three. Okay, there so you go. There she's you go. on a rebound, but she's one more game from Kuznetskova, and she's going to lose. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and and Wozniacki, of course, was and is still. I mean, of course, a very good player, um, but I mean, Svetlana is the is is. I mean, Caroline Wozniacki is no longer ranked in the in the in the, in the world rankings. So. Um, something to look at. Also, before we get into the ones you're going to mention, did you see um, that Federer is now playing world number 772? Is a player who oh my he he retired and he said no, you know I'm kind of done playing. And his girlfriend urged him, you know, go give it one more shot. He played. He he um, he qualified for Wimbledon. He won his match yesterday, and now he has to play Federer. <laughs> It's like, well, and Federer is all excited about it. It's like a, it's like a it. true underdog story. It's like, man, I, I'm really gonna try and like come back here. You know, my girlfriend's really encouraging me. I've I've done I've worked so hard. And it's like, oh, and by the way, you, win one you got match. Roger, you got Roger Federer next, and it's like, yeah, 
Oh. <laughs> oh, great. I can't wait. And Federer's excited to play, so that's an awesome story. And Federer's obviously, he's, he's always been like a really, really, really great guy. dude. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I always find a lot of those top five guys are, you know, Djokovic seems like a really cool dude. Andy Murray seems a cool guy. Um, even sometimes Nadal seems like frustrated by things. He seems like a cool guy. And Federer's always seemed like just a super nice dude. So, um, Keep watching um, Wimbledon, guys. Um, but Ben's got a couple more updates. Um, uh, some some on the men's side and some f- finished games already on the women's side. Yeah, so Serena Williams won in straight sets today. Looking Andy for Murray. a comeback from the loss in uh, the French Open. And the Australian Open. Yeah, back-to-back. So Serena Williams wins in straight sets. Andy Murray wins in straight sets. Stan Wawrinka wins in four sets. So some of the big guns there, their first-round matchups, not, not losing really, mm-hmm. you know, doing as they're supposed to, so. We'll keep updating you as Wimbledon goes on throughout the week. On the Thursday, same way as we so. update you guys uh, on the Euros, and we did last week on the uh, Copa America Centenario um, on our soccer show. Don't forget to listen to that, too. Uh, yeah, well, we've, got anyways. A, we've got a really interesting episode to record today. I'm really excited for it. Well, um, we will make them have to wait to listen to that one if you want to get into our winners and losers of the NBA draft because, man, we got to get going, man. Okay, so we have some winners and losers of the drafts. Obviously, when I look at the winners and losers, it's not just about who you draft because yeah. mm-hmm. there was a ton of trades that really went on, some big, big trades. And some big names leaving teams, too. Not just, like, not yes. just you know, the, the uh, you know, Bogdan Bogdanoviches of the world, you know, and the Marco Bellinelli. Some big names got moved. Yes, definitely. So the biggest name, of course, you have to mention the Orlando Magic hoping to get a surge – of energy with the trade they pulled with <laughs> oh, the Thunder that's there. Good. That's Do you like good. that one? That was good. So the, the uh, Orlando oh Magic gosh. trade to get Serge Ibaka from the Thunder, and the Thunder get back Victor Oladipo, a really good young shooting guard from Indiana who was drafted by by Orlando a couple years back. Mm-hmm. They get Ursan Ilyasova, who's really a, a stretch four kind of style, like Serge Ibaka was at the end of his tenure there in OKC. And then they get the rights to the number 11 pick, which is Domantas Sabonis. He's a stretch four out of Gonzaga, really good rebounder. Mm-hmm. I think this is a huge, huge win for the Thunder, Alex. Do you think it's a win for the Thunder? I think Absolutely. so too. I, I think so too. To be to be one hundred percent fair, I think the Thunder kind of came away with some uh, some pretty handed handed win on that one. It's, it's pretty one sided. I feel like definitely. I think I think when you get rid of Ibaka, he had one year left on his deal. So mm-hmm. as when he's become a free agent, you probably would have had to overpay for him. He's kind of a Highly profiled guy. I wouldn't say he's really that important to them. Kind of was a stretch four at the end of his tenure there as opposed to a guy who played in the post. But he would have demanded a lot of money with the CBA constantly going up. So you get rid of a potential big contract problem with Serge Ibaka. You bring in a good young player in Oladipo, a good defender as well. You bring in a stretch guy in Ursan Ilyasova who can do a lot of the Serge Ibaka style. And then you bring in a young guy in Sabonis who is a great rebounder and can really complement a guy like Steven Adams who's kind of the now the big profiled big for the Thunder, the big you know, seven-footer, a good defender, a good rim protector, who gets a lot of rebounds. Now you bring in Sabonis who can maybe complement Steven Adams there. I think it's a huge win for, for the Thunder, and they're just trying to rebuild this roster in hopes to try and get Kevin Durant to come and re-sign. He's a free agent now, so I think he will stay with the Thunder, but you never really know. You know, I think it's down to the Thunder and the Warriors. Okay. You know, that the chance of him going to the Warriors would give you probably the best team in the NBA, which add Kevin Durant, that would be unstoppable. So that thought is always going to be in KD's mind, but I think his best option is to stay with the Thunder, rebuilding that roster. I think it's a lot better now with the trade, so... I don't know. They're they're probably my biggest winner of the draft. Okay. Now, who's your biggest loser of the draft? Well, I think me and you can maybe agree on this. I'd say the biggest mm. loser, I, I think the Kings, man. So, for to get a little bit more in-depth with it, the Kings opened the day uh, with the number 8th pick. They traded the number 8th pick, like we said, to Phoenix for the number 13 and the number 28. Yes, and the rights to Bogdan Bogdanovich. And the right, yes, and the rights to Bogdan Bogdanovich. Um, as the day was getting going, before they ever made that trade, they traded Marco Bellinelli to the Phoenix. I'm sorry, to the um, Charlotte. Is it the Hornets now? Yeah, yeah Charlotte the Hornets, Hornets again, right? Yeah, for the 22nd yeah, pick. Yeah, to the, for the 22nd pick. So they started the day with 8 and 22 and turned it into 13, 22, and 28. From that point right there, before any pick was made, they were a winner. You turned one pick into three picks in the first round while still having a second round pick that they use later in the draft. 
which can give you a lot of young playmakers for a young coach like um, like David Yeager to use, you know. So what do they do with the number 13 pick, you ask? They draft center from Greece, Giorgio Papagianis, or Papagianis, however you want to say it. Yeah, I think it, the G's a Y. Yeah. Yeah, but they – Papa they, New Guinea. So um, <laughs> who was universally viewed as a non-lottery pick. Yeah, he had, I, he had I very up of, and down analysis. I saw a lot of draft boards that had him honestly between the forty and fifty mm-hmm. range, maybe as high as like the late twenties, early thirties. So yeah. a guy that you could have gotten probably a lot later at thirteen than at thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention you use a top lottery draft pick, even if it still isn't thirteen. I mean, you're still going to get guys that that worked there. There was plenty of guys that could have got. You use not on, not on the needs, not on a one, not two, not three, not four, which you could have used a, a high draft pick, but you use it on a five where you have all-star DeMarcus Cousins. First round pick from last year, Willie Cauley-Stein, who was a true lottery pick last year because he really did earn that spot. And Costa Kufis, not saying that he's like a guy that you can't get rid of, but that's a that's a that's you know quite a, a bogged down number five. And Giannis, is a, he's a huge guy. He mm-hmm. kind of reminds me of the body build of a smaller Shaq as far as weight goes. He's 7'2". He's, yeah. Maybe like 280 pounds. So he's he's a, 100% of five. He's a huge guy. He's not yeah. a stretch guy. He's a guy who's going to play and bang in the post. And you mentioned they already have DeMarcus Cousins mm-hmm. and Willie Colley Stein, yeah, host which, of Kufis, which I don't think he really fits a need. You have exactly. needs at point guard, shooting guard, small forward. Maybe if Rondo leaves, you have Darren Carlson who has the domestic mm-hmm. issues. You could have a, a really, really big need at point guard. Yeah, and then it led to um, Cousins' reaction on Twitter, quote, Lord, give me strength. Did you see that? He, he tried to say that, oh, I was in a yoga class when that happened, which might have been the case, but I mean. You know what it uh, is. Like, uh, yeah. I, I don't, and then, there's more to read in there. Yeah. And then as they, quote, say um, on the article I read, even though I don't need to read this to know. This is. I wanted to look at somebody else's point of view. The public relations damage continued from there as Malachi Richardson, who they drafted at number twenty-two, which did fill a need. He is a uh, he's a shooting guard. Yeah, he reminds um, me a lot of a. They traded this pick for Bellinelli. I feel like yeah. they're really the same player, just at a younger age. Richardson, which I'm okay with. Richardson's about six eight. He's out of Syracuse. He was a freshman. He's a good good spot shooter. Mm-hmm. Kind of lengthy at six eight. So he reminds me a lot of Bellinelli, which I think is a good pick. Yeah, I'm okay with the other three picks they made after Papagiannis. But so they draft Richardson, who looked just not happy. Um, for those of you to maybe think about uh, how Zach Levine looked when the Timberl- Timberwolves took took him. He just didn't look very happy, you know? Well, uh, um, we saw and we talked about it leading up to the draft. A lot of agents and players did not really want to come to Sacramento. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then lastly, they drafted two more players. Um, do you have their names? I yes, accidentally so, closed that page. So at 28, they drafted Scal Labissier. He's a he's not of, upset about that pick. He's out, of, he's out of Haiti. He went to Kentucky. He really had a disappointing year at Kentucky. I'm a Kentucky fan, so I watch a lot of their games. Mm-hmm. A lot of times... I thought he was kind of lost out there. He really came in highly touted, like a top top five like high school player. He yeah. was projected like projected a top lottery pick in this draft as well, and he kind of fell. I think a lot of these issues, really him struggling at Kentucky, really led to his decline here in the draft. I think the Kings more so, definitely not a need. They have and they drafted Giannis at thirteen, so definitely. definitely but he's not a, a stretch need. guy. He can he's play. A stretch he can guy. play the forward. He is a stretch easily. guy. I think they drafted him more on. The potential and where he was projected as opposed to a need. And then at 59, they drafted a guy out of out of Oklahoma. He's like a shooting guard, small forward. Not small forward, a point guard, shooting guard, Isaiah Cousins. Finally a guard. So they draft a guard. But at 59, obviously they struck lightning in a bottle with 60 with Isaiah Thomas when they drafted him out of Washington. Another but can they, can they do it again with 59 out of Oklahoma? We'll see. I mean, it doesn't really happen very often. These yeah. guys who were drafted second to last... You know, you know, all these guys don't even make it into the final rosters. Mm-hmm. They go to the D League, so we'll have to wait and see. But I feel like the Kings definitely missed out on definitely some needs. Mm-hmm. I was not surprised they went with international flavor here, being with Vlade Divac from that international background. Mm-hmm. And Papa Giannis kind of reminds me of Divac, a bigger guy who plays in the post. So maybe he's going to get that teaching from Vladi, but... I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm, maybe they're preparing for Cousins to leave or get traded. I, I really don't know. I'm not sure what the mindset is here. The three for one you mentioned is a is an upside. I do like that. The mm-hmm. Kings could use players, but I'm just not sure that they put the right players in place with the draft picks. I'll say before we get going here, I will say one thing. Um, I'm lucky as a sports fan to like good teams, 
you know, the Steelers are relatively always pretty solid in playoff contention. The Giants of San Francisco have obviously won three of the last five World Series, um, and including this year where they'll see what they go, you know. Um, the Kings, I come to terms with the fact that they're not very good, you know. So um, I can easily, like I, I, I would hate to be like, you know, people said the Steelers had a bad draft this year. I don't think so. Um, this, I can easily say and agree, I would say that the Kings, as of right now, before you have any pan outs or anything like that with these players, yes, they were losers of this draft. So a couple more winners I have, a quick ones. I think Minnesota is a huge winner with Chris Dunn at five. Mm -hmm. He's a great defender. I could see him being an all-NBA defender down the road, and he's going to get just the greatest coaching from Tom Thibodeau, who is a defensive guy himself. Thibodeau had said that Chris Dunn was his number one on his board, and to see him there at five was a huge shock, an absolute steal, and he was a lock to get drafted. He's a good point guard, really good size, great defender. I think that's a huge, huge pick for Minnesota. They can build on that young team with Carl Anthony Towns, Andrew Wiggins, Levine, and now you throw Chris Dunn in the mix. I think that's a great pick. So we mentioned also the OKC Thunder winner, and my other winner is really the Pacers. Not necessarily for who they drafted because they made the pick with the trade. They traded their pick and got uh, they got Jeff Teague, we mentioned mm -hmm. on the last show. Then they made another trade where they got Thaddeus Young for the number 20 pick from the Nets. So Thaddeus Young, another established veteran. I mentioned that I'm a big big fan of getting veterans as opposed to players here in the draft, especially in the 20 range. Mm -hmm. You're looking at maybe a bench player. So if you can get a, a Thaddeus Young for that pick, I think it's a great move. The Pacers, I think they're doing great things. All right, man. Um, and, well, like, of course, it's hard to, to debate on this until the season even gets here and seeing how these players develop. But, of course, we'll be here. When that happens, and yeah. We'll watch, tell you all about watch, it. watch Giorgio Papagiannis be just a stud, rookie Alex. of the year, rookie of the year, and then I saw everyone's this tweet. just like, "Oh, this is the greatest pick ever," mm -hmm. and everyone said it was terrible. I saw this tweet that was all like, "Yeah, whatever." When when Papagiannis is the MVP in twenty twenty two, you guys don't say anything to me, okay? <laughs> Wouldn't that be crazy though? I would like to say. Oh funny. my goodness! Everyone, oh, this is the worst pick. No, I kind of compare it to how the Knicks fans booed Chris Dabbs Porzingis last year, and he had a great rookie year. Mm -hmm. Dirk Nowitzki got booed, and obviously he's a more, Chris probably, Webber got booed. the greatest international player to ever come. Asia got so, booed. Yeah, so maybe we'll maybe Papa goes, Giannis man. could be the next one for the Kings. You never yeah, know. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but as always, we want to thank you guys for listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Um, ben, guess what? What's that? It's our longest show ever today. And we're not even done. We have another show coming. We do. Um, we're going to cover the uh, – well, so there was my list. There you are. We're going to do um, cover some of the College World Series between Coastal Carolina and Arizona. And game one was last night. Game, game two one tonight. was indeed last night. We're going to go ahead and cover some of the Olympic basketball and some Olympic news. Then we're going to cover some racing. We don't ever get into racing enough. So we'll just talk a little racing. Uh, but I always want to thank you guys for listening. Uh, you can find us at gsmcpodcast.com as well as on our Twitter pages, uh, gsmc underscore sports. Uh, same handle for Instagram. Don't forget to use the handle. Uh, GSMC Podcast Network, sorry, hashtag GSMC Podcast Network. Uh, ben, you have anything to say to these folks before we get going? Uh, Kuznetskova against Wozniaki is final now, so Kuznetskova wins 6-4 in that second set. So she, she wins in straight sets. Uh, and just a quick update there at Wimbledon, so not much else. Well, all right, man. Um, like, again, like always, we'd like to thank you guys for listening, and don't go anywhere for the ne uh, this next episode. Like I said, it's going to be pretty great. Oh, they're all great. I mean, this one's going to be just as great as the rest. All right, guys. Well, we will see you later. Don't you forget about us now. Thanks for listening. Have a good day.